Okay, welcome back to the service bench, everybody. I have a special little video today. Uh, I'm finally going to go over the operation of the Philco Mystery Control System. Uh, I touched on it very briefly in the repair videos I did for this 3955 chassis and showed a little bit of it in action, but you can't really get a, a better idea of how it worked in those because I didn't show any close-ups of it or describe any of the systems. The heck, I didn't even show how I was running the thing in the first place. I apologize for that. Now, uh, this is, uh, for reference, this is the world's first truly wireless remote uh, available for public uh, public use. Uh, Nikola Tesla did demonstrate the use of radio signals as a means of remote controlling, uh, well, mechanical objects well back, I want to say, the late 1800s, 1890s or so. He had a small toy boat that he operated with a radio receiver. Fairly rudimentary. I think it only had steering control, but it proved the principle, although Tesla never really developed it further. He was a very strange man. However, uh, manufacturers of radios from the 20s and 30s would try different schemes for remote controlling. There's sets from mechanical systems in the 1920s involving uh, cables or uh, even attempting to use motor or chain drives for things. Uh, you start to see some attempts at remote controls for fixed channel selection in the, I want to say, the mid, the early to mid 30s. Not very common, though. Uh, this system, however, really blows all of those out of the water, being that you have no wires connecting the two together. This remote here is a separate uh, wireless transmitter, and the radio receiver itself has a complete extra section of tubes and gear to interpret the signals coming from the transmitter and allows you to operate the volume control and one of eight fixed uh, stations, which are adjustable from tunable slugs in the back of the set. But we'll get to that later. And uh, when Philco unveiled this at the 1939 World's Fair, it was really, really unique. Uh, the use of a telephone style dialing system and there is something slightly messed up here because that does not want to uh, rotate quite nicely. My remote is a little worn out, I would admit the plastic is quite warped so it's not perfect but it gets the job done. But uh, as I was saying it, it really was a first of its kind. Uh, unfortunately it didn't stick around very long. It seems they ran with it for a few years and then it seems to have dropped off before we got into World War II. Uh, I want to say the 1939, 1940, and maybe 1941 model years had examples of these radios. Uh, when they launched they had the 3955 which is this chassis and the 39116 which was his bigger brother had a, an extra tube or two. Even had an extra tube in the uh, control receiver part although I can't seem to figure out why. It looks like it's just there for um, tube bloat, honestly. Bump up the numbers a little bit, get people to spend more money. Uh, that being said, let's take a look at the inside of the remote first to get an idea of how it works, and then we'll move on over to the chassis to get an idea of how those signals are interpreted into mechanical motion, because it is fairly ingenious. So it can be a little difficult to get a sense of scale as to how big the remote is, but my hands for reference, and uh, I don't know, a pencil for scale. It's what, one pencil width? So it's a fairly bulky unit with not a whole lot going on inside of it, as you'll see. Uh, it is fairly tall. Uh, it's got a nice sloped contour to it. The front actually has this nice pattern and the Philco name on the front. Some fairly nice veneers in here. I'm going to refinish this. Uh, to match my uh, 4216's cabinet, which is in factory original condition. Just needs a little bit of polishing. Uh, for controls on the remote, we just have this one nice little wheel right there that spins, or that's supposed to spin. And this little guy on the front here, which is uh, fairly important, this is how you get volume control. So there are two positions over here on the right. This one's supposed to say loud. That one says soft, so you've got volume up and volume down, and then you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight fixed stations that you can program in on the radio receiver, and then slip a little paper tab into here. Curious that they didn't actually use the eighth one on this remote, but what have you. Now, in order to dial 
any of these, you just flip this normally and it would go back to center if it was working correctly. I think there's a cable in the way there. The other two, however, we have to dial one of those and then when it's on its way back, we hold this down and you can see it doesn't quite make it all the way back until we let go of it and that it eventually does. So, it's a little awkward. I've taken this thing apart a number of times for uh, ease of showing it off. So let's lift this off and we can take a look at the inside and we'll start with the lower section. Uh, first though, I should point out, in order to get this thing apart, normally, normally you would go on the bottom of this and there are, uh, let's see, five screws around there holding it in place. Some nice little felt feet. And then this hole right here, which is the frequency adjustment for the oscillator. This is this adjusts your output frequency and allows you to tune the remote to the receiver and uh, vice versa. I had to fiddle with this in order to get it to work with that one. Okay, with the lid and the uh, pulse unit out of the way, we can actually take a look at the inside here. Now, I will say that I don't have the original battery pack in this. Uh, I will have already done a short clip of that earlier to show you what it looked like. Um, I do still have the cardboard sleeve of it, so this guy would be sitting where this uh, new setup now is. So, the inside of the unit is a very simple transmitter. We have a single number 32 basic triode. Uh, the 30 is just a redesigned 201A with, I believe, a different filament voltage. The original 201s were 6-volt tubes, and this uses a... Well, I think it's a 1.5 or a 2-volt filament. Um, the filament is actually being driven at 3 volts, uh, in this case from a pair of D-cells, and that is to enable the filament to warm up extremely fast, because the dialing process only takes a second or so uh, well, okay, it, it takes a few seconds, maybe two or three, even at the most uh, the most outward setting. So this has to warm up in time for you to release it. If you actually had to bring it all the way down and hold it and wait for the tube to engage, that would defeat the purpose of the remote, and I'm sure they wouldn't have gotten as many interested parties. Having a pretty much a snap action, just like you're dialing a phone, would have made it a more interesting product. You're not really waiting for anything. So that was the easiest way I imagine the engineers could figure to get it ready in time. The rest of it is, uh, and I, I do admit I did not bother to look at the circuit to see whether this is like a Colpitz or a Hartley oscillator, but it is a, a fairly simple oscillator. There are three capacitors in here. We have this one wax that I have not replaced. This unit does work with the original in there, and given the light duty that this is on, I imagine it's probably okay. I may replace it eventually. We have that one there. We have this air variable capacitor, which is accessible from the underside of the unit. This guy right here is what uh, determines our transmit frequency. And there is this one resistor here, and then a small fixed capacitor here, which I believe this is a mica. And the antenna here, our inductor, forms the main part of the tank circuit. So for high voltage on this, we have five 9 volts strung together to give us 45 volts of B+, which is what this was set up to use. Uh, I reused the original socket off the battery pack to connect to this. I suppose you could easily just make a new tether with, some, with like a Molex connector or something. Uh, this is the same rubber wire that's used in the rest of the set, so you might have to replace this anyway if it's dry and crumbly. This stuff is still surprisingly supple and somewhat flexible, so I left it alone. Uh, but you could just as easily replace it with same colored wire, etc., etc. Uh, now, the original battery pack did hold in place with three brass fingers, one of which I've had to omit because it's, it would be right in the path of the socket placement. Originally, the socket was over here, and this bundle was actually tied to this bracket right here. I had to cut that to reposition it. Uh, I have considered adding a small piece of Z-metal to this thumb nut to enable it to lock down this board, but I'm not going to be shaking the remote, so it should be okay. Now, to couple this 
we have a three pin socket down here at the right and this connects the B plus and filament circuits to the pulsar unit which I will take out of the lid and show you next. So now that we've looked at the inside of the lower section with the oscillator and the tube and the battery pack, um, let's take a look at the pulsar unit in here. And I want to check, uh, I want to show you really quickly how to get the upper half of this apart because the mechanism is held on the inside of this and it's entirely trapped underneath all of this stuff. So in order to do that first, and it was pretty easy on mine, this center section here has a threaded stud that hangs out of it. And we can just spin that right off of there and get that out of the way. And I'm going to cheat a little bit here. Um, actually, maybe no, I won't. I do need to get this. I can get this out of the way for a moment. There are three machine screws on the center. They are not very long. And once those are up and away, we can lift this off of the center. And my dish is pretty badly warped. Pretty common with plastics from that era, except for Bakelite. Really wish they might have made this out of Bakelite. Now I'm going to try to set this somewhere where maybe I can warm it up and get the thing to flatten out again. Uh, because it dragging on the cabinet and preventing the unit from working right is a little bit annoying. There's not much of a drag, but it's there. Uh, the next phase then would be to remove these four or sorry, these uh, five Phillips head wood screws that take this brass ring off. And underneath this brass ring, there are four slotted head machine screws that attach to this assembly here. And once those are all out, this will drop right out of the center. Oh, actually, before you can take the brass ring off, I should say, we need to get this guy out of the way because it is attached to this mechanism and it is blocking the ring. There are simply Let's see if we can get this to show up. Two flathead machine screws here and here. Take those out. That uh, Those two plastic pieces will drop free. And then you can see we have uh, one, two, three, and there's an extra nut hidden just under here. Those nuts are being held to these rubber bushings just by age. Uh, you might drop those free when you take the screws out from the top. So this comes off, this brass ring then comes off, take out the four screws, and the pulsar mechanism will drop free. I'm going to skip to that part with the pulsar unit out now. So with the mechanism removed from the inside of the lid there, we can actually see how this whole thing works. So this is the attachment point for our dial. Let's see, we can grab a hold of it and uh, get it to actuate there. And there are four rubber grommets here that suspend this unit from the inside of the lid, probably for a little bit of dampening. And more importantly, there is a spring steel clock spring inside uh, this right here. And it actually attaches via this post right there. Now, originally, there is a small loop on the end with a crushed steel rivet. Uh, mine had snapped off and the spring had gone all over the place and it would not recenter itself. So I had to anneal the end of the spring with a small torch, loop it over itself and put the screw back in and then wind the whole thing up to get sufficient tension to run the mechanism. So that all works fine now. So our connection here from the uh, rest of the unit comes in. One of them attaches to this brass frame. One connection goes to the outermost set of contacts here. And it's worth noting, if you look at the back here on these rivets, half of them are not used and half of them are. And the third connection goes through this phenolic plate here. Now on the back side, we have, uh, well, first off, we have a Philco inventory number. But we have what is effectively a sort of flyball, not really a flyball, but just a governor system. This uh, ensures the distance between pulses, the, 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 the speed it operates at is relatively even. Even if I was to wind the spring up tighter, this would presumably slow it down and ensure that the, the pulse width is the same at all times to ensure proper operation. Now I have pulsed the unit pretty quickly and it seems like it should be able to keep up even if this was out of time. 
but if the pulses were too far apart, uh, that could cause errors, especially if you were dialing volume control. It might get stuck there and adjust that. Now on the other side, we can see all of the pulse contacts, which I have cleaned. And it's a little more difficult to see, but there is a center contact ring. Let me check the screen here. This guy right here, this center track is what triggers the filament circuit. So there's a wiper just here. That's our inner wiper for the filament. And then our outer wiper is this guy right here. And if I spin this up, it immediately connects the filament right about there. So the filament is now warming up. And because you'd be dialing this fairly quickly, by the time, even if you got it all the way to the very end of the contacts, the filament would only just have gotten warmed up. It only takes it maybe a second or so, but you should dial it pretty quickly. So now uh, B plus is hooked up to the, to the uh, outer contacts. The filament is lit. And if we let it go, the mechanism, whoops, my finger out of the way, will drag the outer wiper all the way across to the end. So here we are dragging it, and there's a bit of a delay. So this has time to get the filament engaged before it grabs the outer wiper and brings it around as many times as it needs to be. And then we let go, and the governor maintains the speed. Now to get the volume control to hold, uh, you have that little button that sits just up right here. And I always thought it was supposed to pinch the plastic on the outside and hold it in place, which I thought was kind of cheesy. Uh, it is not, in fact. That is just an aesthetic feature. Um, the, the, uh, the button actually hooks up to these two lugs right here, and when you press down, you're actually maneuvering a brass peg right there on the right side, and if I move this over just a little bit and hold it, so it's trying to wind back up. If I push this down, it comes down and it stops right there. And that is on the next to last contact, and that is ensuring that the B plus uh, connection to the tube is maintained. So in that position there, we will be outputting a constant uh, AM signal at whatever 370 some odd kilohertz. And that will drive the motor in the set uh, either up or down, depending on what we initially dialed. And then you release it, and it resets and shuts the whole thing down. So that's the main mechanism. Nothing too fancy, honestly. I was under the impression that it was just going to be a dial from a rotary phone. However, I happen to have... I believe this is an automatic electric company rotary dial system. Uh, the rotary dials on a phone are actually a little more complicated and they are actually the reverse of what this is. This has normally open contacts on the dial circuit, whereas a rotary phone actually has normally closed contacts and it pulses them open. So that wouldn't even realistically work, and plus the contacts in my example are a little worn out. So if you wanted to make your own, you would have to have some sort of relay in between this dial and the uh, plate circuit to ensure that you're getting normally open instead of normally closed. That makes sense. So now, with the pulser unit out of the way, I suppose I should put this whole thing back together. Okay, so for reference, if I can hold this still, this is the official schematic for the mystery control. So you can see we have our contacts here, on the selector wheel. So that's for the B plus connection for setting the pulses. We have the contact here that connects the filament to its power source. And then we have the 45 volt battery here which gets connected into the uh, 30 through these contacts and, and com completes the oscillator circuit effectively. Uh, the main coil, the center tapped guy right here is also our antenna winding and there's the main variable cap, and then there's a small 200 picofarad uh, trimmer. Oh no, this sorry, this is a this is a 200 picofarad fixed capacitor uh, across the main tuned one here, and a single 500 ohm resistor. Now they do show there's a 0.05. That's the axial uh, paper cap that's in there. I have thought about replacing it. 
It's interesting, they place it directly across the power supply, which at 45 volts, it might not be that bad of an idea, especially if this leaks. That means my 9 volts may actually run down if this has got some leakage on it. I have to think about that. So my initial attempt to pick up the signal coming from the mystery control didn't do so well. Uh, I was directly connected to the actual uh, oscillator coil. However, this time I am going to actually use a coil of wire connected up and we're going to pick up the signal wirelessly like it would be a normal operation. So if I just dial out oh, about the third station on the dial here and let it go. There's our nice sinus little signal and if we take a look at what it looks like if I just maintain it for the volume control that's all there is to it. Nice clean AM waveform. So now that we've looked at the remote and its basic operation, let's see how, it how the receiver end of things converts those pulses into mechanical operation of the volume control and the station selection mechanism. Because it's rather ingenious. Now the receiver section, located on the left side of the chassis from front, is four tubes on the smaller models like the 3955 and five tubes on the larger models like the 39116 and then the later 4216 and so on. Uh, the additional tube is actually right here and it is a 6ZY5. There is a 6ZY5 in this set, but it seems that the larger units, uh, quite honestly, I'm not sure why they had the additional tube. Hmm. Interestingly, this circuit states there should be a 6J5 in this position, but there is not. That's a little unusual. Either way, at the front end we have a 78 for an initial stage of RF amplification. We have a 6J7 here for another stage of amplification. A 6ZY5 double diode provides automatic gain control for the incoming signal, and then that signal is simply connected to the grid of the 2A4G uh, thyrotron. And the thyrotron here is what derives the selector mechanism. So this is just a very basic AM receiver uh, connected to a tuned loop antenna, which we'll look at in just a second. And the incoming pulses are simply amplified uh, evened out by the AGC and then uh, used to directly drive. There is no detection because it is there's there's no modulation on it. The carrier itself is the signal. It's either there is a carrier wave or there is not a carrier or I should say there either is a signal coming in or there isn't a signal coming in. There's no message being codified on it. The, the presence of the signal is the code itself. Now, in order to get that to the set, instead of using a conventional antenna, we have, if I could just barely bring this into shot here, a large custom wound loop. Is that even in frame? Probably not. No, it is not. I apologize. So the loop here normally sits in the bottom of the cabinet, and I'll have to insert some pictures later of my cabinet once I get this reinstalled. But this sits at the very bottom. There is some compensating, there's a compensating capacitor down here. Uh, this loop is very important as the front end of the unit, the 78 here, is connected is a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a tuned loop tank circuit, so it provides some pretty good gain as opposed to just running a ground wire and a normal uh, straight line antenna. I, I could see why they did it. Because you want to make absolutely sure that you can pick this up. And with a transmit range of 25 feet maximum, having this large antenna is probably what makes that a possibility. Less like likelihood of interference because this loop is specifically tuned uh, to the signal the transmitter is outputting. And then the IF stages in here are also tuned to that. Uh, for maximum sensitivity. So there are two wires in that case, a red and a black, and there are a pair of matching terminals at the back here that are labeled red and black for those connections. Uh, the wire on mine is in pretty sad shape. I am going to have to replace it, but it does work. And more impressively, um, I did not actually do any tuning in either of these sections on this radio. 
I simply adjusted the output of the transmitter itself to get it to work. I'm sure it would work even better if I actually took the time to match everything together the way Philco says to, but for demonstration purposes this works and this remote does not belong to this set anyway, so that's a whole other uh, can of worms. Uh, either way, nothing particularly special about this except for this last tube here, the 2A4. So underneath this tube shield is the 2A4 Thyrotron. Now the, the Thyrotron in this set is responsible for taking the uh, signal re received from the sending unit, the individual pulses, and using them to drive the relay mechanism uh, that in turn drives the ratchets underneath uh, the radio. The reason why we're using the 2A4 or the Thyrotron is because a conventional vacuum tube uh, doesn't have a very high current capacity. Just ignore what my hands are doing. I'm recording over this again. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm probably saying is that the, the uh, relays have such a low resistance that it, would it takes a fair amount of current to actually get the electromagnets to pull in and engage. A standard vacuum tube isn't like, a, like say, a 6A8, a 6K7, some normal triode or pentode. Uh, they're not really designed to, to pull a fair amount of current through them. Uh, they make very good amplifiers if you're dealing with audio waveforms or other signals. Uh, and for that, we typically bias those tubes into what's called the, the ohmic region or the linear region. Uh, where they can very easily reproduce a sinusoidal waveform. A thyrotron, on the other hand, is specifically designed to operate in two states only, either uh, conducting or <coughs> non-conducting. And it achieves that by being filled with uh, usually a noble gas. However, uh, my research has shown apparently they also occasionally used hydrogen, uh, and apparently even deuterium in some. Argon was pretty, is much more typical. And what happens is you're relying on the uh, voltage between the plate and cathode to actually ionize the gas inside the tube. And what happens when you ionize that gas is that the electrons just sort of go all over the place. They actually allow a substantially better conductive path for the electrons coming off the cathode to reach the anode. So what you effectively have is a, is a like a multiplicative factor of uh, of uh, electron flow. You have substantially more current going from cathode to anode than a standard uh, vacuum tube. But what makes it uh, really interesting is that once you trigger one of these tubes into conduction, which is very easy to do, you, ha you, you uh, apply an anode voltage just below what's called the striking voltage, the point at which the tube wants to conduct. You just hover it right below that, and then you have a usually a grid connection, or there might even be multiple grids, and you feed a low voltage pulse to that, small signal, and that extra voltage is just enough to get the, the thyrotron to snap into conduction. Even if you take that pulse away, that signal away, it will continue condu to conduct until the current traveling through the plasma decreases to the point where it can no longer remain ionized, and then the whole thing shuts off, and it creates a, a brilliant glow uh, neon lamps do the same thing. They're also a plasma. This is usually a purplish or a bluish white uh, fluorescence. It's rather beautiful in operation. We'll, we'll see that later. But because we're able to get much more current flow through the 2A4 than a standard vacuum tube, it makes it perfect for driving relays or high current lamps or motors. Thyrotrons wind up in a lot of industrial applications uh, for that time period. So that's, that's why it's used here. Now it's important to note that um, one method of shutting these off is actually to use a sinusoidal or an AC supply across the grid and cathode so that uh, even if you receive a signal, as soon as the AC waveform switches polarity, uh, the tube wants to shut off. And then once it flips back, it's ready for the next pulse. This allows us to have a string of pulses coming from the remote and not have the thyrotron get stuck on after the first one because the transformer feeding it, which lives right next to the tube on the chassis here, uh, is constantly changing the polarity of the uh, power supply to its plate and cathode enough so that it is on when it needs to be and shuts off immediately after the trigger pulse is taken away. 
which allows it to act effectively as, um, well, honestly, like a relay, but it requires substantially less power. Uh, so hopefully that was uh, a, a better explanation if you've never seen one of these before. And I think I'll hand it back off to myself. Um, sorry if that bored the crap out of you. I just haven't had the chance to talk about that ever. Uh, the Thyrotron is actually the parent of what would eventually become the silicon-controlled rectifier. Same operating theory. Uh, small voltage signal is used to trigger it into conduction, and it will remain in conduction until you either uh, remove the the, uh, the the plate current effectively, or you reverse bias it, or reverse the polarity across the uh, plate and catheter. In the case of a uh, an SCR, the uh, Oh, the source and drain. Either way, this is our driving element providing enough current to get these relays running. Now this whole business right here is not all that complicated, just an AM radio receiver. The real magic is in this control unit. And unfortunately, getting in there to really look at it is a little bit tricky. But I will try to do my best. Now we are directly over the control unit and I have the, the can that covers it normally off. The can actually has some foam padding on the inside to cut down the noise when this is running. Now it's hard to see, but on the inside here we have two relays, and do I have some sort of poking device? So the one on the left here, this guy right here, has a finger that goes down into the lower section here. This is our advanced relay, that's what I'm going to call it. So this is what actually does the selection process, you can hear it moving things around. This arm right here can swing back and forth and the entire assembly can move in so it's it's uh, it's advancing a ratchet effectively. Now next to it right here we have the hold relay and this guy is really important because if this relay does not operate then the none of the selector system will work correctly. In normal operation when we get a signal in both of these relays become energized but, if you'll notice, the amount of effort it takes to pull this one in compared to this one... Oh, okay, it's, it's hard to see. Just, just take my word for it. This one has a lot more spring tension on it than this little guy does. The hold relay needs significantly less power to keep it engaged than the advanced relay does. And this is what enables us to get the volume control going. So, it's, uh, I'll, I'll take a look from the back side so you can see some of the ratchet mechanism. But the idea is when a signal comes in, this relay will pull in from the, uh, the signal immediately. And when we get a steady stream of pulses in, this ratchet will begin clicking. And you can hear how we're advancing a ratchet down there. But if I let go of the hold relay, the whole mechanism resets to the first position. So if we dial volume up, for example, the first pulse coming in will cause this guy to pull in and then the next ones will cause this relay to begin engaging. And we'll look at the schematic to get a better idea of why that is. So we get one, two, three pulses right about there, and that's where our volume up position is. And if we have a continuous signal coming out of the, uh, of the remote for volume up or volume down, these two relays remain engaged, and then when we let go, they both drop out. Now if we're selecting a station, this one will pull in and then we'll advance however many we numbers we need. And then at about position four, we get a little more force required and we start advancing the selector switch. Now there is a maximum position and we've just reached it right here. So that is the last station. And if I let go of the hold relay, we reset the top ratchet. And if I come back in and go to select a new station, one, two, three, four, that loud clunk right there was the station selector ratchet going all the way back to the home position. Uh, this will become a little more apparent when I flip this around and give you a better look. Okay, so to make matters worse, it's a little bit dark in here, so it's um, I'm having to use a flashlight to get the inside of the mechanism shown off. So this is the, it's really the heart of the selector mechanism. We have two ratchets stacked on top of each other. We have this disc up here which is driven directly by the control relay up here on the right. This guy, hold relay is over here on the left for reference. And you can see there are two pegs. We have a peg up here and we have a peg right over here. And this guy is 
spring loaded. And if I depress the hold relay and start advancing the upper ratchet, you can see that disc on the top moving. And if I release the hold relay, it goes back to home. Now, if we were to select volume, we would get pull in, one, two, three. Now there is a switch on the left there. This guy right here, I believe that's the mute switch. Uh, there is up front, there are contacts that operate the volume control motor. So if we pull this in and we advance it three positions, I think it is, uh, or no, I think it's, it's two for up and three for down. Hang on a second. Uh, my apologies. It is two pulses to get volume down and three pulses to get volume up. So if we hold it in, go click, click, that is volume. Oh, I just said it too. That is volume down and one more pulse. That is the volume up position. So all that's doing is uh, connecting a pair of contacts to ground one set of windings in the volume control motor. Now, if we go to four clicks, right there, we get past the volume control position, and now we're ready to start pushing the lower ratchet around. And the lower ratchet has a very large spring in there, which I had to replace because the old one was stretched out to infinity. Now, the lower ratchet is connected directly to the selector switch for the stations on the underside of the chassis, which I'll look at in a moment. The important thing to remember is if I release the hold relay now, the top ratchet will reset. However, the bottom ratchet has this hand right here holding it in position. This is what allows us to select a station completely independently from the volume control without having to go back to square one. Now, what happens if we go all the way to the end of the station selection? So there are eight possible stations, and if we get this all the way to the... Oh, oh, Okay, I already kind of revealed it. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's maximum right there. We can't go any further. Reset the first one. What happens is as soon as we're ready to start dialing a new station, regardless of where we were before, what will happen is as soon as the control ratchet here comes over and gets ready to select a station, we're going to push the lower ratchet hold out of the way and drop it back to zero. Now we're in the position to grab it again and start selecting our station. So even if we've gone two pulses, reset, come back in to select a new station, one, two, three, four. Now we're back to the very first channel and we can select a new one. Now we've selected a channel if we want to control the volume only instead of selecting a new channel. One, two, three to get volume up, and we hold it there. Reset it, and then we can select a new channel again if we so feel like it. And there we go. Uh, getting proper tension on this spring was very important because in operation, this relay is moving pretty quick, and it doesn't have a lot of guts. So using too tight of a spring here will prevent it from advancing. Using too weak of a spring will prevent it from returning correctly, and I did already lubricate this shaft in here. And if you think you need to get these shafts apart, uh, best of luck to you. These screws that are in here are not, uh, these, these are male on the outside, some sort of a lug. Uh, I had no chance at all trying to get those apart that are trapping the lower assembly together. I just sprayed some lubricant in there, got it freed up and working. That's as good as it's going to get, uh, honestly. Now, if you have to remove this section, uh, there is no physical connection between this lower drive assembly here for the switch and the ratchet mechanism. So if you take out the three screws to mount this assembly, you can lift this entire thing up and out of the way. The lower switch is actually just um, coupled to this by this phenolic wafer right here. And there are a pair of little uh, rubber fingers on either side that hold a metal plate right there. And uh, that's, that's all that's coupling the two of them together. And I can manually reset that. So that's all that there is to it there. Okay, so we're underneath the chassis now, and we're taking a look at the selector switch itself, just to wrap things up. So down here, we have our fixed, uh, well, our adjustable coils for our eight fixed stations that we can select from. And the 
switch here has three segments, one of which couples in one of these guys in place of the local oscillator. The left section here, which has all these nice colored wires that I installed, this is for the panel lamps on the front to show you which station you're selecting. And then the other half of the tank circuit has a set of contacts down at the bottom that connects into the fixed capacitors uh, that are have uh, adjustment holes on the outside so you can set the station. And each of these have ranges marked on the back of the chassis for what you can set them to. Now I can manually run the relays here and we can see Hold in the hold relay. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Come back around, and there's back to home. So that's that is literally it. Now I will say cleaning the contacts on this is a little tricky because the fine wiring from these inductors is directly in the way. However, I went in with a pencil eraser. And I cleaned all of these, and I also deoxidized the underside of those fingers because I can't remove that hub. There's just, there's, there was no way. So instead of trying to rip all this out and move it around and potentially damage it, uh, I cleaned everything in situ, and it all works rather nice. I had a heck of a time getting good continuity between this grounding tab and these panel light connections. They were very intermittent, but after a good soak with deoxid, clean and dry, everything works fine. Okay, hopefully the resolution on this is decent enough. So this is the control amplifier circuit for the uh, mystery control. So down here on the left, this little guy right here is our tuned loop with a uh, variable capacitor in there and a... Uh, I can't remember if that makes it a patter or a trimmer capacitor. Uh, that goes into a transformer here to the... Oh! Uh, the first amplifier here, first control amplifier, which is the 78. <coughs> that goes to the first stage of IF. Actually, from the look of things, there's only the one stage of IF between these two. Into the second control amplifier, the 6J7. That goes into the automatic gain control tube, the 6ZY5. Um, on the 50, uh, the 39116, they have an extra uh, tube thrown in there. Again, not sure why. And then we have this coil right here, which couples the output from the 6ZY5 to the, the uh, Thyrotron's grid uh, in order to drive the mechanism. Now what, what stumped me the first time I looked at this, and I need to move the schematic over a little ways, is the actual interface between, let's see if I can get this a little better, the Thyrotron and the relays. So our Thyrotron is here, and the plate circuit comes out on top here, it comes around, it goes through a small uh, uh, radio frequency choke, which is actually a circular wound guy tucked up on the inside of the chassis underneath a round, or underneath a metal rectangular can. There's some capacitors hiding up inside there, and what folks might miss. So this, these all the guys all right here are all tucked up inside with this RFC. So keep an eye out for that if you're working on one of these. Those all have to go for this to work right. Anyway, that comes down, and it goes to, here are the coils, the two coils for our selector mechanism. And they've got two little paddles on there. Now what threw me off about this whole thing, so we've got the lights, got the inductors, this is all the tuning for the automatic tuning, you've got the motor for the volume control, and you've got the switch segments, which, uh, Per manufacturer typical, they've got a little dotted line that shows a connection between the relay assembly and each of these switch sections. And the assumption that I made initially was that all of these are ganged together uh, and that they all had to move together. Now that is obviously wrong, but it, would, it confused me because I hadn't taken it apart all the way. What really stumped me was the fact that both of these coils are in series. Uh, and they are in series from the supply, which they actually come off of one side of the 120 volts coming out of the wall. And then when they go through the cathode, that goes back to a, um, a filament transformer for the tube. So slightly less voltage going through here. Uh, not much. There's, there's a capacitor across them that's only rated at about 50 volts. So there's not, not too much going through there. Or at least I would hope there isn't. 
Uh, anyway, so you have these two guys, and then you have this capacitor, 16 microfarads, and a 150 ohm resistor uh, placed across these two. And it wasn't until after I got the thing working that I realized what they've done is you have the advanced relay and the hold relay are in series. Now when you first select, say, channel 8, when those strings of pulses come in, when the fire the thyrotron fires up, current starts flowing through both of these, the hold relay, because it has the, the weaker spring tension of the two, pulls in immediately, and then each of the pulses coming in that trigger the thyrotron uh, on, because it, it normally biases, it biases itself off, um, normally because of the spacing between pulses you would expect the hold really to drop out. That is prevented by having this capacitor and resistor combination here to provide just enough current flowing through this assembly to keep the hold relay in place between pulses. Now the uh, advan the um, what do they even call it the well the advanced relay anyway will only engage when there is a long enough pulse. So when it, uh, because it draws more current, when it, when it goes into the laps between pulses, this guy will stay put, just enough current to trickle it through. This guy won't produce enough of a field to draw in all the way, and so it'll drop out. And that's all there is to it, which is really impressive. And then of course, when you hold down the transmit button for volume control, it just holds these two on because the Thyatron is continuously receiving a uh, drive signal. As far as the volume control goes, that's pretty simple. Uh, there are two empty contacts, and then there are... Um, okay, well, it's a starting position. There's, there's two empty contacts, one of which is the home position, so nothing's supposed to happen there. So if you go two clicks up, you get to increase volume, which just goes through... Uh, the motor windings, and then over to ground. Um, or sorry, it, it gets grounds this side of the winding, the other side comes from a, a, a special transformer to power it. And then if you did uh, three clicks, that's volume low. Same thing, different set. And then there are some capacitors in here, which I imagine are snubbers to reduce the arcing on these contacts. I did actually see a little bit of that looking through the video of this thing running. Uh, but then that's really all there is to it. You get the selector switch that uh, couples through all the lights. You have the selector switch that hooks up the inductors and the selector switch that hooks up the capacitors for the individual tank circuits for those channels. Uh, one other thing that I figured ought to be pointed out is that the switch on the front that selects the remote control as being active, uh, that's this guy over here. And this is actually part of the control, the first control amplifier tube circuit, and it looks like it either it uh, it grounds out the cathode of this tube, or it grounds out the connection going over to these lamps. Yes. So right now it's set to the position where the remote is active. So the uh, the connection through the sensitivity control which is this variable resistor right here, which is actually a knob on the back for extreme or near distance with the remote. Uh, that is set up to go to the ground. If we flip it back to normal broadcast or police or one of the other bands, it'll go from A4 to A2, and that will ground out the other side of the light circuit. Uh, now they can get away with this because the lamp circuit has a 10 ohm resistor going to the six volt rail and that prevents this just from shorting out that, although that 10 ohm resistor then has to put up with uh, the filament transformer current going through it, which uh, it looks it looks like it's large enough to be able to deal with that. But uh, yeah, that's that's about all there is to it for the, the circuit side of things. So I say let's uh, go try it out.